Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from New York Community Bank, M&T Bank, PBM, Customers Bank, Collins Building Services, Amtrust Title Insurance Company, Marks Paneth, Capital One Bank. Additional funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from Amarant Bank, Bank of America, Citizens Bank, Dime Community Bank, Douglaston Development Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handro Properties LLC Handler Real Estate Organization, Hodges Ward Elliott Inc., Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, John Kesmatidis Red Apple Group, Keysight Capital Partners, New Banks, Meridian Capital Group, Ocean First Bank, People's United Bank, RPW Group, TD Bank, and these friends. Boy, certain people have been involved with real estate for many years and through many cycles. So I'm lucky today to have Jim Kuhn, who is the president and head of investor services for the Newmark Group. So Jimmy, over your career, as we were just saying before, how many cycles or events took place? You know, recessions, yeah. financial crisis, 9-11, 2009, and then the pandemic. So I would say five or six depending on whether we have smaller ones and bigger ones, you know, whether you count the Russian currency crisis or not, but, but certainly six. How do you look at this crisis, the, the pandemic as it compares to the others? Much different. I, I think all the others were the result of some financial imperfection in the system or a structural imperfection in the banking system or an overabundance of uh, property or a tax event that caused developers to build too much. This is none of those. This was a healthcare crisis when in fact, most of the companies were very healthy before the pandemic. I think there was $215 billion of dry powder in the private equity firms. And it was an event that most people felt uh, when it came to an end, we, we wouldn't have to guess that things would be better. And of course, there's a lot to talk about when we say that. You know, there's lots of discussions about office, return to work, you know, biosciences. There's so many different topics. Let's look at the evolution of the industrial revolutions in the current last two centuries. And, the, and, and you'll see where I'm going in a second. Um, you know, in the early 20th century, you had the atom and out of that became everything from atom bombs to, to lasers to things that are not as relevant today, but they're the underpinnings. But the second half was the digital revolution about bits. Um, so you had the digital revolution with the internet, um, and now you have the gene revolution, which was the mapping of the human genoi, genome uh, in the early 2000s. And then what she has accomplished and then the mapping of the human genome you basically ended up with the confluence of the innovation economy and now the biopharma economy, which, which together saved the world because both of them together enabled us to produce vaccines at a much accelerated pace as in the past because of AI, because of the cloud, and because of the mapping of the genome and her discovery of RNA, which basically take instructions from the DNA and produces proteins. And that they maneuvered that to create the vaccine. So my long-winded answer um, is that if you look at the stock market and, and how it reacted to the pandemic, you saw that at first everything went into the tank March, end of March, March 26th, but then the market discovered that there were certain industries in real estate 
um, which were going to not only survive the pandemic, but prosper. And so that was, you know, life science. It was multifamily in the growth cities. It was medical office buildings. It was self-storage. It was what we refer to as the alternative groups. Um, and industrial, of course, flourished because not only did you have last mile delivery and you had online retail, but they had to get closer into the urban cities to be able to deliver the goods. And then the cold storage came out of that um, because you needed to store these vaccines in, in places of very low temperatures. And so that was what happened. And when we look going forward, especially in New York, we need to identify which cities are actual competition for us today because of the innovation economy and which cities are competition because of the bio clusters and what we can do as a city that has so many advantages to either equal or surpass those industries, which will be the anchor for New York for years to come. Let's look at bioscience. New York, you know, is Alexandria was basically the first people to come in. Right now, there's limited vacant space for bioscience. A couple of people are involved, but also Westchester is going into the bioscience. New Jersey is going into the bioscience. How do you see New York City to accommodate? You know, there's this discussion about taking some of the buildings in Penn Plaza the neighborhood, taking these buildings, knocking them down, and making office buildings. Well, let, let's start with the fact that when you talk about biotech, it's not just office, it's wet labs, dry labs. And it's not easy to take any building and convert it because you need to have the right ceiling heights, you need to have proper storage for the chemicals, um, you need to have uh, an area where you're not venting out in residential buildings. New York City right now is probably the sixth life science hub. And notwithstanding that there's no vacancy, there's a reason there's no vacancy, and that's because there hasn't been enough of demand from the bio community to convince enough developers to build spec wet labs, uh, ground up development, or conversion. Now, you do have Alexandria. They've been here for a while. They have price advantage for first mover status. Um, but you also had King Street in Long Island City, and you have Taconic that's been in the business for a very long time, and you have Longfellow that's going to do the deal with the blood center, um, but that's going to take some time. I think New York City and, and EDC is committed to life science, but having said that, you know, the cost to be here is not cheap. And there is no program that allows you to build a life science building um, that to be competitive price wise with a Westchester or Jersey. Having said that, the thing about bio clusters is they want to be able to walk down the street, have lunch with their, with their scientists, with the research people. And so um, I think that New Jersey especially um, can be, um, have a symbiotic relationship with New York in the region, but it's far enough that it's its, its own separate bio cluster. But you know, New York is, is up there one or two in NIH grants and the ability to have venture capital New York has all the ingredients to become a life science center similar to Boston, Cambridge, which is the epicenter, the 100% location, Northern California, which has become Emeryville, Berkeley, uh, and then UC San Diego um, has helped perpetuate the Torrey Pines area. And now IQHQ is actually building in downtown San Diego. Seattle has uh, many of the technology firms that have helped innovate, and then Raleigh Durham because of the, the universities and hospitals there. You need to have research university with scientists uh, working on uh, new discoveries in the DNA, RNA world. But let's, let's also get to the topic of um, these multi-level industrials, because as we know, industrial is a required space. We need additional industrial. Okay, they're talking about three level, four level industrial, which the cost of the construction is enormous, and you need a lot of land for the ups and downs to get the trucks in and so on. So where do you see potential in the industrial? I think industrial in New York City is in somewhat of an oxymoron. Industrial is the hottest sector in the country. Everywhere, it's booming, but it's single story industrial. Um, there will be some demand for two-story industrial. Um, if you can figure out a big enough site 
how you get the trucks up and down. Um, but I don't really believe that the cost that it will be for the tenant will justify three and four story industrial buildings. I think it's going to be difficult. I think what has to happen is we have a lot of property in a lot of the boroughs, probably close to transportation and highways, where if we could figure out how to use that efficiently for, for more traditional industrial, um, I think that New York can satisfy its online uh, on-time delivery of product by the industrial companies. Um, but I think that right now, Jersey is second or third largest industrial market in the, in the country after Southern California and maybe Chicago. So I'm not sure that the logistics is going to be the industry that sort of leads New York out of this uh, semi-recessionary period of time. What do you think of uh, the idea about the media? Okay, you know, there's been a lot of media. Netflix is building in Brooklyn. Uh, Silver Cup is expanding. Other people are expanding. Uh, Lionsgate is expanding in Yonkers. And there's also expansion in New Jersey today on the studio business. So I think the studio business is in demand. To some extent, it's been dominated by two players, HPP, which sold Hackett's uh, studio platform to Blackstone, and to uh, Hackman out of California and Square Mile that backs them. Um, it, I, certainly in the Southern California market, they've been dominant. And I think in New York City, you'll see that battle continue, I guess, with Kaufman Studios, et cetera. Um, I think it's a very important industry. I think New York City needs to continue to support it, the mayor's office. We really have to decide what the priority is for New York City's, and to some extent, New York State, what, what their budgetary priorities are. And then we have to figure out the balance between creating jobs in industries that are growing while not neglecting inequality in the cities. And it's a very fine balance. And it can't be one way or the other. The private sector can't steamroll over the public sector. But on the other hand, the public sector needs the private industry to create what they need most, like affordable housing. So I think New York City is in an interesting position now to recreate the city in an image for all people, but not at the expense of Wall Street or real estate or wealthy or um, you know, losing tenants to Florida as San Francisco is losing to Texas. Um, but I think we have plenty of time to, to fix the problem. Um, and we certainly have to fix our schools and, and, and create more affordable housing, but you can't do that without the private sector. What about the, 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 the repositioning of certain buildings? I mean, a number of years ago, a lot of the industrial buildings were converted to offices. Talk about lower Manhattan. The 421Gs were the incentives for office owners to convert their buildings and the certain tax benefits. Do you think we have to do something like that today to get these old office buildings, which are B or C properties, and some of the other, you know, the hotels to be repurposed? I'd rather reverse the question and say, how do we create more housing? And, and I think the answer is some platform like the old J51 program, which enabled you to convert an office building or a hotel to multifamily housing um, without having your property taxes go through the roof. Um, but you know, all these are very complicated questions because on one hand, the city and the state will say how much do I want the developer to make? And the developer is gonna say, how much can I make? And then you negotiate, which we'll have to do the new affordable housing plan, which runs out in 22, right? It went from 80, 20 to 70, 30. Where's the tipping point? I think anything that we try to do to create jobs or housing or schools in the city can't be about how much somebody is making. It has to be What's our objective and what's the conclusion that gets us there? And I think that right now, with the polarized politics we have in the country, it's very hard for both parties to reach across the aisle and get things done. And it's no different right now in the sense that 
yes, you could have a program that will take apartment houses and, and hotels and convert them to multifamily. But based on the rent stabilization laws in New York and the weak condo market, you know, how do you incentivize developers to do that without the, a huge part of the underserved population feeling that A, the neighborhoods aren't gonna get gentrified and too expensive because you're gonna have some form of market housing inclusive with the affordable. And so this is a balance that, that, that has to be a public-private uh, partnership and we have to make sure that we, we satisfy both halves or nothing will get done. So how do we do that? How do we satisfy both halves? I think a lot's going to be determined by who the next mayor is. The Albany, how they're going to react um, in their policies. Look, I think we've had in the history under Koch, under Bloomberg, um, we've had, you know, public-private partnerships that figure out how to get things done and how to make everybody in this city feel like they're getting something out of it. You brought up the subject of bioscience. One of the largest tenants taking space today is the hospitals, okay? You know, I walk down the street, I see HSS, I see NYU, I see all this. Do you think that certain places like the Cleveland Clinic, the Mayo Clinic, uh, and some of these other out-of-state mega healthcare systems will come to New York and New Jersey because the opportunities are here. We have the people. We have the quality of the people. We have great hospitals here. I don't know that we need to have more hospitals. Um, I don't know that a hospital can afford to come here and build ground up. I think that I would rather see us focus on helping the hospitals here with research grants and incentivizing them to do exploratory work um, in, these, in these research centers and to partner with the private sector to create incubators. Because inevitably, to have a bio cluster, like, like in the cities I've mentioned, over a long period of time, new companies have to be created by scientists that are working for an institution, usually a university, Columbia, NYU, et cetera, um, or a hospital that does research in a medical center. And so I don't, I don't know that it's about bringing new hospitals here. This National Jewish Hospital formed the partnership with Mount Sinai, and they're here, but that doesn't necessarily create a lot of new jobs, but it creates a lot of good research. Research well, is very important. What, what's your thoughts about retail? I think retail is never going away. I think the um, people want to go out and shop and browse. Um, they may not choose to do it in the mall, but in New York City, you know, I'll bet you in two months, if you go down to Spring Street or Prince Street, the streets will be packed. Um, I think if you go on Upper Madison, notwithstanding that rents got too high, I think people want to be there. I think the whole issue with retail is, is about price because the retailers have to say, how much can I sell in this box and how much can I afford to pay for rent? And do I need to have a bricks and clicks option, not just online? Um, so many of these businesses have gone out during the pandemic and they were in trouble before the pandemic. I think retail is important for the city. It, it's the lifeblood of the pedestrian experience. And, but I don't know that we can help fix that ourselves. I think that one of the things that has to happen is supply and demand. And I think that the rental will meet its level. Leaving multifamily aside, and we could argue forever about the shortage of housing and whether it was created initially by rent control and stabilization, which today, of course, is necessary. But, but you, when you think about office and retail, um, you will be dictated by the market. And so I believe that in good locations, landlords will have no choice but to rent at a level that they can attract the best tenants. Um, I, I heard Marianne Gamartin talk on a panel I was on this morning, and she's building a, an apartment house in Chelsea. And what she said was, we decided that the type of retail tenants we had in the base were more important than the price we got. And so when we designed our building and, and made the budget, we made sure we budgeted a low amount that we could get amenities for the building and for the neighborhood. 
And, and I think that ultimately retail is fortunately not a big part of many of the office buildings overall rent role. And they will eventually figure out what tenants I need, what tenants are credit, what's going to help my tenants, what's going to bring somebody to the building. You know, there's a lot of retail in, in streets and avenues that may not need it. And so not all retail will, is created equal and not all retail will survive. But I think retail is, is going to be a huge contributor to the research in New York. What's your thoughts about the Midtown East rezoning? So I think the Midtown East rezoning was the right idea, but I'm not sure that from a cost perspective that it will work for many owners because notwithstanding that we would like product to be brand new A class product. We have 450 million feet of space in New York City and a very small percentage is, is A space. I think that the office space um, will never all be A space. And I think that's sort of the issue that you're, you're getting to, I think. Okay, what about the discussion uh, with regard to Penn Station, an area that you know well? There's always been a potential the transportation system in Penn Station. And of course, when you can connect Penn Station to Grand Central, it'll change the whole landscape. I should say if, but if and when, right? It goes back to your question about East, East Midtown zoning. Even if land is free, it doesn't mean that an office building pencils out at 120 or $130 a foot. The price of property taxes in New York, which are, which are really have gone up a lot, depending on what your taxes are gonna be when you're done, what your operating costs are to clean the building, et cetera. So these are very complicated issues, which we know what the end result we want to achieve, but getting there, you know, there've been so many projects, Michael, you go back in time, you think about Times Square, you think, you, you think about Columbus Circle, you think about lower Manhattan, um, where the Reichmans built battery parks. Most of these projects failed. They failed because when you're doing development, you can't pick the market you come into. You can't pick the interest rate environment you come into. And so most of the time, these big projects are challenging. You gotta carry the excess land for a long time. The second guy in or the second woman in gets it at a price that's really more reflective of what the market is. And I think that history teaches us that it's not just what we want. It's what we can justify and what, what will be the end result when we're finished. Question, what's your thoughts about developing office space in the boroughs? I think it's difficult. I don't see right now the demand in the suburbs other than city and state agencies or smaller tenants. I think that we take a great neighborhood in Brooklyn where people want to live but the demographics and the geography and the transportation is if you have workers who live in Long Island or if you have workers who live in Westchester, getting to Brooklyn is not so easy. So I think that office space in the boroughs will evolve slowly, but I don't see it as being a, um, an ancillary, ancillary market to Manhattan. So let, let's fast forward one, one question about you know, the work from home. Let's talk about January 2023. At that time, what percentage do you think people will be working from home and working from their office? Are we talking New York? We're we talking the whole country. I'm talking about our market, New York. Okay. I believe that people who want to stay in New York want to be in the office. So I would say 100% of the people that work in New York will want to be in the office some of the time. So we start with that. I don't, think, I don't think remote work is something that works full time for anybody, even if they think it works for them, because they're missing the interaction and the creation of ideas. Now, if you ask me, do I think it'll be 100% of the people, 80% of the days, yeah. Workers will want to say, I will work in New York. I will commute to New York. I like to be here, but I can't do it five days. I have young children. Um, 
my husband or myself have to be home one day a week. We want to see our kids play softball and, and lacrosse. So I think there's a place for remote work. But I think that if you're going to live in New York, why would you want to work remotely? Now, if you don't want to be in New York and you want to go to Raleigh or Austin or Nashville or Miami, then you're going to go there. But if you're going to be in New York, I think you want to be in the office. And it's not just in the office, Michael. It's in the office. It's out at lunch. It's out at dinner. It's going to see clients. Um, our brokers have been in for months now because they, they have to be in. They want to be mentored. They have to show space. That are programmers and that may feel like they could work all the time and they don't care. But I just think overall, when you live in a great city like New York or San Francisco, you want to be immersed in the environment of the city. Well, why do you want to be here? Jim, half an hour has gone by. I'd like to thank you very much. Thank you for the years of being a good friend and a supporter. And thank you very much for your comments today. It's always a privilege and an honor to be here, Michael. Thank you. Thank you.